What's up guys? We're back with part two of the Atari Assembler Editor Cartridge. Let's dig deeper into this tonight and let's get into the commands, let's get into the memory usage of it, and let's also talk about some assembly language. Without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so we're gonna pick up where we left off last time where we talked about this program and just to see how it worked before, this program basically um, changes the border color on the Atari through each vertical interrupt. So every time there's a vertical interrupt, we load the value of the scan line that we're working with and we store that as a value into the uh, color register and that changes the color of the border. You press a key and it exits. So what we did not uh, learn last time is actually how to save that source code out to the disk drive. So that's gonna be the first command that we talk about today and that is the list command. It's very similar to Atari Basic where you can actually list your basic programs. Um, there's two ways in Basic, save and list. Save kind of encodes it into a basic format. List actually lists it out as text and that's the way you do it with the debugger or with the editor assembler. So you do list pound sign the drive letter um, D and then you give it a name. So for example, border.asm. And you can see it actually goes out to our trusty Atari 1050 disk drive which we are using today with the five and a quarter uh, disks. You can see I've got mine labeled assembly for my assembly language programs. And um, that program has now been saved to the drive. We can actually go out to DOS. I'm using Sparta DOS. And we can get a directory of that disk. We can see we've got border.asm, okay? Let's use the car command in Sparta DOS to get back out to the cartridge. Now, in order to get that program back into our editor, we use the enter command. Same format, enter, pound sign, drive letter, colon, file name. That'll actually bring the listing back into the editor. So now you don't have to retype your programs every time. You can type it, save it to the disk drive, and then bring it back in at will. There, now, if you have a printer, um, you can actually list the program out to the printer with the list command and the p colon um, as the designated device. Okay. Now, if you want to assemble your code to disk, in other words, save it as an object file that can be then later loaded into memory via DOS, uh, you do your assemble command, but you give it the source file name, comma, the file name that you want it assembled out to, and I would use the object file, OBJ extension, so you can designate the difference between the source code and the object file. And I forgot to put the pound signs. Oops. <laughs> so let's put the pound sign on both of those. Happens to the best of us. Okay. And that'll actually go out and write the assembled object code to the file name border.obj. Okay, very good. Let's get our listing back up. So the other thing I want to talk to you about today is memory usage for the editor assembler. Okay, so when you're talking about editing source code inside the, the uh, assembler editor, you've got the text that you're editing, okay? You've got the line buffer, which is actually how you're typing your commands, okay, and your instructions. That's called the line buffer, and the line buffer is uh, can be up to 384 characters, okay, just for FYI, okay? Um, each time you type a, a new line of code, that line buffer is overwritten. Okay, so what we can do is we can use the size command. And there's three fields here in the, the size command. And the size command basically gives you the line buffer starting number, which is 1C70, and it gives us the top of the memory of our editor source code, in this example right now, 1EAD. And if you were to take those two values and subtract them from each other, you would get roughly the amount of memory that your editor, your source code is using. 
And the last column, the third column, in this example, 9C1F, that's the top of the maximum memory. So for this computer, the 130XE, uh, the way that I've got the memory set up right now, I've probably got roughly 34 to 36K worth of um, memory that I could use for my, my, my source code, which is plenty of for any of the programs I'm gonna be writing. But that's what the size command does for you. It gives you the, the line buffer where you're currently at memory-wise and um, the top of the, the memory eddy for your editor, your editing line code right there, the second one. And the third one is the top of memory, the max of memory, okay? Now going back to what we did before in our debugger, <clears throat> let's make sure we have this assembled. When we go into our debugger, last time we learned about how to trace the program. Trace in the starting location will actually run the program and give you a step-by-step -step instruction and your registers statuses for each instruction. And you can watch the memory change for each instruction, okay? What I'm gonna tell you, talk about now is the step command. So if we do the step command, step 4000, that will go instruction and then break, okay? So you can see here we've got our first instruction where we load the X register with the immediate value of 255 and hex. So if we type S without a memory location again, that will step to the next instruction, which is storing the X value, the X register value into memory location 0T, 02FC at hex. And if you hit S again, it'll go to the third instruction and so on. So you can use the S command to step through your code instruction by instruction, and you can watch your registers change that way. So this is called single step tracing. Okay, so that's the next command we wanted to learn today. Now, while you're in the debugger, you can also display memory by using the D command. So for example, you can display what's a location, memory location 4000, okay? You can display, for example, 4010, and so on. You can also give the a range of memory. So you can tell it to display, for example, 4000 through D, excuse me, 4100, or 4100. Uh, why didn't that work? Hmm. Oh, I put the D twice. 4000 comma 4100, a little rusty here today. There we go. Okay, so you can see our program in memory here. And there's our, there's our actual machine language code in memory for our program, our very simple little program. Okay. So that's the second command, that's the second command we wanted to learn about today. All right. Now, let's go back to our editor. And, <coughs> excuse me, there's a way that we can renumber our programs with the num command. If we just type the num command and press enter, um, that will actually start at the last line number used, and it will give us the next line number in tens, which is the default numbering uh, increment. And then we could do, for example, another command. And you can see when I press enter, it goes to the next one, and so forth. And if you press enter on a blank line, that'll stop the automatic numbering. So the next command we're gonna talk about is the REN, or renumber command, renumber statements. If we type REN by itself, it will go through and rename or renumber our program starting with the line number 10 and increments of every line number after that in tens, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and so on. If we do a renumber space and give it a number five, for example, that will renumber our program in increments of five. So now you can see our listing is 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, and so on. We could actually do it in increments of one, by typing REN1, and you can see here, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now, I don't recommend that you do that. You know, I always like to have at least 10 in between each line number, but it just goes to show you that the REN command is useful for renumbering your source code, especially if you've typed some code 
and you can't quite fit some code in between, let's say you've got, you know, line 60 to 70, you've got 11 lines of code that you'd like to put in between 60 and 70, I would redo, I would do a REN 20, and now you've got 20 lines of code in between each section. So it's a really easy way to, to clean up your line numbering and to give you some more room in between the line numbers. Now, following up with the renumber command, we've got the delete, the D-E-L command, and delete will actually go through and delete statement numbers uh, you can actually do one line at a time, or for example, like 270 is now deleted. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put that back so that we don't lose it. But if we put in 271 with an arbitrary command, we put in 272 with an arbitrary command, and now we come in and look at this here, we can actually delete 271, comma. 272, and that will delete a range of line numbers for us. So now if we go back and look at the source code, we've actually got those deleted, okay? So the delete command will actually delete an individual line, or it will do a range of line numbers for you, okay? Now the next command we're gonna look at is the find command. <clears throat> okay, so the find command allows you to search your source code for a particular you know, a piece of text. So for example, if we do a find quit, we, we open with the slash and we close with a forward slash. <clears throat> you can see here that it found them line number 210, the word quit. And it finds the first occurrence of it, okay? So for example, if we do a find slash loop, I know I've got loop in here twice, it finds the first occurrence of it at line 110. If we wanted to find all occurrence all occurrences of loop, for example, we would do open, we would open it with forward slash, type the word we're looking for, close it with a forward slash, and then type comma A. And that will find all occurrences of that text. So that's handy if you're looking for a specific keyword or a memory address or a line of text. That's how you would look for it and you would find it, okay? So the next command we're gonna look at is the replace or as it's known, REP. So let's go ahead and use that loop label. Let's go ahead and replace loop with the word loop one, okay? And just like with the find command, we open and we close uh, everything with our forward slash, forward slashes. So that went through and it replaced the first occurrence of loop with loop one. See how that worked, okay? So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna change that back to loop because I wanna show you how you can do it with multiple occurrences. So basically we would do replace loop with loop one, all occurrences. All right, so now we've got loop one replaced everywhere. There we see how that worked. And I'm gonna put it back so I can keep the source code as it was originally. All right, so that's how you use the replace command. Okay, so the next command we're gonna look at is gonna be in the debugger. So while we're in the debugger, we can display our 6502 registers by typing dr, display registers. So that's a handy way of just looking at your registers. Anytime you want to look at them, you use the dr command. Pretty simple. Okay. Now, there's a way to copy memory or a memory block uh, by using the m command. And I want to be very careful about this. I want to find a piece of memory that is pretty empty right now. So for example, 5,000 is pretty, pretty empty right now, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do M, and we're gonna copy our first block of memory from say 4,000 where our program is located, okay? So we do M less than sign, the starting memory block, okay? And then what we wanna do 
is we're going to, actually, let me back that up. We want to put the, um, the destination memory as our first address, so 5,000. So we're gonna copy into 5,000. Then we're gonna use our less than sign and we're gonna give it the starting block, okay? And we're gonna give it the amount the, or the number of blocks or the ending block that we wanna copy through. So let's say 4010. Now, as you can see before, we displayed 5,000, it was empty with zeros. So now if we come back and we look at 5,000, we can actually see it's our, our, our source code. See how that worked right there? So using the memory command, you can actually copy memory, a memory of block, from one area of the computer's memory to the address that you're specifying as the first parameter. Okay? Now there's an also a way that you can compare memory or compare a memory block using the V command, okay? And it's the same format as the M command. So for example, we can compare starting at 5,000, less than sign 4,000, comma 4010. That comes back with empty because it's exactly the same. If you want to see differences, let's move this up to 6,000, 6010. And did I do something wrong? Yes, I did. This needs to be a less than sign. And that'll show you the differences in the memory. So you see up, up at, at 6,000, we've got zeros, 6,000 to 6010, it's all zeros. And in location 5,000 to 5010, we've got actually our program. So using the V command, you can compare a memory block, starting range, ending, ending range, with uh, you know the memory location that you specify. Now another cool feature of the debugger, you can actually disassemble memory. So for example, we can disassemble starting at 4,000, and we use our control one key to pause, and you can actually see there's our program in memory disassembled. So this is a cool way for you to come in and look at various parts of the Atari operating system by using the disassemble memory and giving it a starting address. Last but not least, I've been asked to explain the source code and how it works. So I'm gonna do my best to do that. I put some comments in the code as you can see. Um, the first line is obvious, that's our starting location for our program. Uh, the next line, line 30, loads into the X register the value of 255. Line 50 stores that value of the X register into location 2FC. 2FC is the hardware internal location uh, memory map to the last key pressed. We show a 255 in there because that's kind of like where it's at when no key is pressed. We start our loop um, with loading the accumulator um, location D4OB. D4OB, if we look that up in mapping the Atari, it's called the V-count, and it's the vertical line counter used to keep track of which line is currently being generated on the screen. Uh, use, use during display list interrupts to change the color or graphics mode. Uh, peaking here returns the line count divided by 2, ranging from 0 to 130. So that's going to give us the vertical line. Uh, the next line... Uh, store the accumulator in to location D4OA. D4OA is known as the WSYNC, Wait for Horizontal Synchronization. Basically, anytime you want to stop the OS and allow it to synchronize the vertical TV display, um, it causes the 65, anytime you poke a value in here, any value in here, it causes the 6502 to halt and restart uh, seven machine cycles before beginning the next TV line. So basically it causes the, the CPU to stop processing and allows the, the, the sync to catch up and synchronize. Um, and then what we're doing is we're storing the value of the accumulator again, which happens to be the vertical line number, um, into the background color. And that's what gives us the different background colors on the border. Uh, the main screen doesn't change its background color because there's a display list, which is another advanced topic we'll get into in the future. Um, there's a display list defined in memory 
that controls what that looks like, but the border is not part of that. So that's how we are able to change the color um, by actually the V count, the line count actually ends up being the color that we're using. So then once we once we change the background color, we load the X register um, from the value which is whatever is in 2FC. So we're basically seeing if a key has been pressed at, that, at this point and we're comparing it to 255. If it's not 255, that means that a key was pressed and we're gonna branch if not equal to quit. So if it's not equal to 255, we're gonna quit, which means a key was pressed. Otherwise, we're gonna drop right down into our jump statement at line 230, jump back to the loop, which takes us back up to loading the next, um, the next vertical line. So basically, this is just going in a loop, going in a loop, going in a loop, grabbing the vertical line number, um, calling the W sync, halting that until it syncs, changing the background color, checking for a key, comparing it to 55, quitting if it's not, otherwise we're looping. And we can see that work one more time. There you go. So, there you go. Hope that um, keeps you busy enough until the next video. Now that we've got the commands and we know how to use the editor, we know how to save and load our source code, now we can start getting into some real assembly language programming and teaching you how to program in assembly language and using the 6502 processor for doing graphics and sound, which is kind of like where we want to be. All right, so there you have it. The Atari Assembler Editor, part two, complete. I hope you learned some good stuff in this video and I actually hope that you will now go and start practicing with your own Atari and your own assembler editor cartridge. And um, next time we're gonna do some assembly language programming and we're gonna talk about the 6502 um, instructions and we're gonna talk about the different addressing modes and get a little bit further into assembly language and um, ultimately get into some more graphics and sound. I've got some more basic tutorials coming up where we're gonna get into player missile graphics and the ultimate goal of this series is to get you familiar with writing um, programs in basic and in assembly language, using the assembly language programs in the basic to speed the basic up, and uh, ultimately to write some games. I mean, that's where this series is going ultimately. We wanna write some cool games that we can show off to our friends and family and we can play them. So anyway, like and subscribe, hit the bell so you get notified when the new videos are released, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again.